this article is very appropriately the very first one in the major controversy section, I think we can all agree that this is a major lack of consensus. <laughs> okay. So I would like to acknowledge the enormous contribution of uh, my co-authors, Ronald Krauss, Gary Taubes, and Walter Willett. Um, this article really captured the spirit and the vision that the BMJ started with in terms of bringing scientists uh, and, and experts in, in their own rights who have very divergent views and put them together. Now, this has been uh, quite a humbling experience. And uh, thank you for my co-authors for keeping me on my toes and for uh, giving me the Peace Negotiator Award. <laughs> OK. So my disclosures, I sit on as an expert member on uh, committees uh, for both dietary fats and uh, low carb diets. Any views that I express in this presentation are my own and not the groups. So we started, as Darius already referred to, uh, some 50, 60 years ago now for this uh, mantra of the diet heart hypothesis, uh, a fatty diet, raises blood cholesterol levels, which leads to atherosclerosis and uh, therefore myocardial infarction. And from that, we came to uh, a position of uh, promoting low-fat diets, and uh, industry responded by producing low-fat products and even zero-fat or fat-free products. Um, over the last few years, the major part of the controversy has been have we got it right? Have we got it somewhere in the middle? Or have we got it wrong? And actually, should we be focusing on low carbohydrate diets? And in fact, in that mantra, the advice would be not to avoid fat, but to in fact eat more fat. Because when you have a low carb diet, you replace it with something. And that has to be fat, largely. So is this a position of we are yo-yoing around? Or has the pendulum swung? What should individuals do? What should policymakers do? And indeed, there's massive interest, massive passion, uh, and you know, religious zeal about deeply held views. There's confusion, but what is the evidence? So first and foremost, we need to recognize that fat is not just fat. It's not one homogeneous entity. So fat is made up of saturated fatty acids, unsaturated fatty acids, which are mono or poly. So I'll refer to them as MUFAs or PUFAs, and trans fatty acids. And then further, we have had fantastic progress in research on understanding the different types of polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-3s and omega-6s. Two things I want to highlight here. Firstly, the concept of isocaloric intake, which means there's a balance of macronutrients within total energy intake. So when one goes down, another goes up. The second, funnily enough, is something we, I think, largely can agree on. And there are two things we can agree on. One, that the trans fatty acids, the industrially produced trans fatty acids uh, from hydrogenated fats, we should eliminate and avoid in the diet. And secondly, that the uh, omega-3 fatty acids, by and large, both from plant sources and seafood sources, are beneficial for cardiovascular health. So I'm not going to talk about those because I have very limited time. And I'm going to focus pretty much on saturated fat and its replacement in the context of cardiometabolic health. So current guidance, uh, pretty much the world over, focuses on keeping fat intake to under 35% of energy intake. Some even advocate under 30%, and uh, saturated fat intake to be under 10%. Some have made progress and moved on to de-emphasize total fat intake, but to focus on fat quality. And what I mean specifically by that, for instance, the very recent presidential advisory from the American Heart Association uh, concluded that uh, the uh, saturated fat should be lowered to under 10% and replaced with unsaturated fats, particularly polyunsaturated fats. So let's look at the evidence, a closer look. So first part of that diet heart hypothesis is about effects on lipids, particularly total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. So indeed, in that isocaloric model, when carbohydrate is replaced with um, saturated fats, LDL levels indeed go up. Whereas if replaced with these other fats, they go down. But there's more to uh, lipids than LDL cholesterol alone. <clears throat> 
And with these um, HDL molecule, as well as triglycerides, and the ratio of total to HDL cholesterol, what we see is that with replacement with um, uh, saturated fat, there's a very minimal or non-significant effect, whereas with uh, replacing carbs with MUFA or PUFA, there's uh, a benefit for this risk predictor marker, uh, which is total to HDL cholesterol ratio. But replacement nutrient matters uh, as to what that is. So previously I showed you about the uh, replacing carbs with uh, different fats. Here, if you now go into replacing saturated fat with different nutrients, what do we see? And to summarize very briefly, this is from feeding trials. More than 80 of these uh, were meta-analyzed. And all three substitutions, whether you substitute with carbohydrates or with MUFAs or PUFAs, achieves lowering of total and LDL cholesterol. Um, the ratio of the two is uh, reduced when, uh, replaced, uh, when SFA is replaced with uh, PUFAs or MUFAs, and APOB uh, is uh, reduced with all three. The effects are biggest for uh, this substitution, which is from the saturated fat to polyunsaturated fats. So what this leads us to understand as the evidence unfolds and progresses is that uh, LDL is one marker of CVD risk. There are other markers that are also important. And also not covered within this are yet other features even of the LDL particle itself in terms of its particle size, its density. And one of our co-authors, Ronald Krauss, is a re leading expert on that particular topic. So moving on to the hard endpoints, clinical endpoints, well, there's a massive amount published, and I'm not going to go into every single piece of research, but this slide summarizes the uh, evidence to date of all the meta-analyses that have put together the randomized clinical trial evidence on this topic. And these are basically, in summary, trials that have uh, analyzed existing uh, RCTs, uh, many of them done in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and they come to somewhat different conclusions. And there are many reasons for it, including and, and primarily the issues of quality of the underlying studies themselves. The achievement of nutrient goals, whether th th there was sufficient difference between uh, the intervention arm and the control arm. So let's take one of them, uh, where this was actually by Darish Mozafarian. Uh, and this was a um, synthesis of the RCT evidence on when saturated fatty uh, foods are reduced uh, with intervention with uh, uh, N6 PUFAs in particular, or total PUFAs. And the things to note here particularly, are look at how old the trials are. This is what the, ev the, the evidence that's available. Look at the lack of power individually amongst the trials with the very small number of events and sample size. Look at the fact that adequately controlled trials did achieve a difference in the PUFA intake in the intervention arm versus the control arm, so that's a good thing. And putting that together, the overall pooled effect was a risk reduction of about 19%. And actually for a 5% energy uh, <clears throat> uh, substitution of PUFAs for saturated fats would equate in this to a 10% relative risk reduction for coronary heart disease. Modest, but important. With the limitations of trials themselves, Darius referred earlier to RCTs, whether they are the gold standard is questionable, particularly for uh, 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 lifestyle factors. We have to turn also to other forms of evidence. This is a summary of the prospective observational evidence. And this opens up the po a possibility to look at free living populations, not in controlled conditions, and very long-term follow-up. So the, some of these typically would go up to 20, even 30 years of follow-up for incident hard endpoints. Here too, there is disagreement, some showing that there is a reduced uh, risk when SFA intake is uh, reduced, <clears throat> but others don't show that. And a key reason for that is, again, methodological, because some of the studies either do not specify that uh, nutrient replacement, which is critical, as I think I've already explained, 
uh, or uh, the, the replacement was not done well and it was not specified, or it was mixed replacement. <coughs> So let's take one example from all of those prospective studies of one which I consider to be a good example. This was the Jacobson study, which uh, pooled analyses across 11 prospective cohort studies. This was an individual participant-based meta-analysis, and careful control for con confounding factors was possible. And the takeaway message of this analysis was that the type of replacement nutrient matters very much. So when PUFA replace saturated fats, there is a reduction, shown going left here, but when carbohydrates replace uh, the saturated fat, there's in fact an increased risk of coronary events. And it's not only the type, but also the quality. So this is work from the Harvard cohorts uh, with Drs. Hu and Willett uh, as leads. And here, what is shown very nicely from prospective study in a very large sample with up to 30 years of follow-up is that not only do unsaturated fats compared to saturated fat reduce long-term risk, coronary risk, but when the replacement nutrient is whole carbohydrates from whole grains as opposed to defined sources, then there is also a decrease in risk. Then let's think about where have these studies come from. So much of the evidence I've shown you so far is pretty much from North America and Europe with very little evidence from outside. Now this study, the Pure study, opens a new frontier by going into 18 countries across five continents and with uh, a large sample size, a prospective study in urban and rural areas, it valiantly attempted to look at these issues in a global context. And one thing which is very telling is that the intake patterns are very different in different parts of the world. And here particularly, there's a focus shown on the difference between Asian versus non-Asian world regions. Carbohydrate intakes in the Asian regions, about two thirds of the sample, have intakes of more than 60% of energy from carbohydrates. Not the case in non-Asian regions. And conversely, the uh, intake from saturated fatty acids in non-Asian regions is much higher proportionately above the levels that we are alarmed by and our guidelines seek to address, but are considerably lower in the Asian regions. In their analyses, substitution analyses, when they uh, looked at the substitution effects of uh, replacing carbohydrates in this global context, they did find that replacing it with polyunsaturated fats does have benefits for total mortality, as well as for their secondary outcome of non-CVD mortality. They had a very interesting finding of for stroke events, which was a secondary outcome, that replacing carbs with saturated fatty acids reduced uh, the incidence of strokes. So where does this leave us? What do we make of this? Well, let's see if we go back to our North American studies, whether we can begin to uh, get at some of this. And here is an analysis, again from the Harvard group, which this time substituted or modeled the change if you were to replace the energy from refined carbohydrates with equivalent energy from these different fats or carbohydrates from whole grains, what do you get? And actually, I think this is very, very encouraging and promising that it's unsaturated fats as well as carbohydrates from whole grains. They all have benefits if you replace these for refined sugars and refined starches. Okay, so the key takeaway point from this part is that it's not only about the fat. Again, that isocaloric model, and again, understanding that other nutrients are eaten at the same time as the fat and, and are relevant. So here are some of the guidelines from across the world. Here is the UK guideline uh, from the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition. 
uh, which in 2015 gave the uh, guidance to reduce free sugars intake to under 5% of energy. Here's the US guidelines, which is about reducing added sugars to under 10%. Here's the World Health Organization guidelines, very, very similar. Fiber intake should be increased. And of course, I'm focusing on fats and carbohydrates here, but in, a global, sorry, in cardiovascular context, the importance of salt, sodium intake, is also in these guidelines, and it cannot be ignored. Okay, so one area of major controversy is really around what about the role of low carb and particularly very low carb diets, which by virtue of being low carb are therefore high fat diets. In our paper, we discuss this. Uh, we summarize that there's accumulating evidence for short term benefits for weight loss, some lipids, not LDL in particular, and on glycemic and other markers of diabetes. This topic is covered more extensively in at least three other lectures over the next two days, and it's covered in the BMJ articles. So I'm going to move on from this major controversy. Um, next, I want to talk about the fact that having shown you that fat is not a single homogeneous entity, we now have very new understanding that also saturated fat itself is not a single homogeneous entity. Saturated fat itself is made up of uh, fatty acids of diff different chain lengths, some which are odd numbers of fatty acids, 15 or 17, some that are even. Uh, this here is the most common fatty acid in uh, blood here, palmitate, which has 16 carbon atoms, and they're very long chain saturated fatty acids as well. In the INTRAC study, we um, uh, ran an analysis which uh, has been the world's biggest to date on, on an unprecedented scale with 12,500 cases of uh, incident diabetes. And what we found is this uh, point about the odd chain saturated fatty acids being in fact related inversely with the future risk of diabetes. Where do these saturated fatty acids come from? Well, they come almost exogenously from the diet, particularly they're a good marker of dairy fats. Okay, so food source of saturated fatty acid matters. The food matrix is bigger and wider than the sum of its nutrient parts. Moving on to that, we have some unpublished results, so please do not disseminate these. These uh, are hot off the, uh, the, the analysis uh, by Tim Key and colleagues um, this is based on the EPIC study with nearly half a million people, a prospective study with more than uh, 8,000 first events of, uh, of uh, ischemic heart disease. And what this shows in adjusted analyses is that <coughs> meats, red and processed meats, both are associated with higher risk of incident CV CHD. Some dietary factors are neutral, whereas um, yogurt and cheese and also eggs are related inversely. So this goes back to the point that Darius was referring to earlier about the importance of foods and not just nutrients. Lastly, I want to pick up on an area of controversy, which is about safety concerns to do with omega-6 uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, linoleic acid in particular, because in all the um, uh, uh, substitutions that take place when saturated fat is reduced, largely it is replaced by N6 PUFAs, which are high in vegetable oils and, and plant oils generally. And there are concerns about the mechanisms for harm from inflammation, thrombogenesis uh, uh, mechanisms. So here's some data which was a meta-analysis across uh, more than 300,000 people. And what this shows is that in observational uh, dietary linoleic acid, observational studies, dietary linoleic acid, uh, there was a linear dose response inverse association with coronary events. So not only was there not a higher risk, there was actually a reduction in risk over time with linoleic acid. This slide two is not published yet. This, uh, please do not disseminate this. This is work that uh, Darius Mozafarian is the uh, consortium lead for from the Force Consortium. And it sh uh, is, is new data which is showing that now when you look at blood biomarkers of linoleic acid circulating in the blood or in adipose tissue, if I focus on this left-hand panel first, for total cardiovascular disease uh, events, 
overall, these tissue biomarker levels of linoleic acid are related with reduced risk over time. And for CVD mortality, the finding was exactly the same. OK, to end, we found pretty much identical picture in that Interact study that I talked about across eight countries, linoleic acid inversely related and arachidonic acid not related with harm. How this translates back to plant oils? Uh, what about tropical oils? Well, we have lack of long-term studies. How does this link back to global populations, especially when uh, N3 intake is very low? We need more research. OK, so in summary, fat is a complex nutrient. The type of fat matters. As I've highlighted, there's ongoing debate, but totality of the available evidence suggests that risk of CHD is reduced by replacing saturated fat with PUFA but not when carbohydrate is the replacement nutrient. We need to understand the role of different fats in populations with very high carbohydrate intakes, and more research is needed on long-term health effects of specific plant oils and of low-carb, high-fat diets. Take-home message, it's the foods, not the nutrients. Darius already showed you this slide. Reductionist approaches, I will re-emphasize that, for fats or for carbohydrates are unhelpful, focus on healthy food sources of each. And in our paper, please do look this up. Uh, we've talked about the evolution of the diet heart hypothesis, and we have real opportunities to shape the research agenda and guide policy. And starting with this BMJ series, which has brought divergent views together, and this meeting and more, let's discuss, consult, network, and collaborate for better science. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.